You can support the Double Loop Podcast by contributing at patreon.com slash double loop podcast. Thank you to our supporters, and we hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Double Loop Podcast, your source about everything about fingerprints. While you're working on your comparisons, we'll talk about comparisons. I'm Eric Ray. And I'm Glenn Langenberg. Hey, Glenn, uh, where do pencils go on vacation? Pencils? Pencils. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, writing, like pens, you know, pens and pencils. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard pencils. Uh, okay, uh, where do pencils go on vacation? Um, I don't know, Eric. Where do they go? Well, see, this is this is this is topical because I just got back from Pittsburgh uh, a couple weeks ago. They go to Pennsylvania. Ah, uh, yes, nice one, nice, nice. I, I remember last week. I last week you said last week's was like a more of a highbrow kind of thing, and highbrow. I said, "Oh, next week's going to be terrible." Yeah, that's this that's this one. <laughs> yes, yes, it, and and you were true to your word. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and and well, but the, let me let me read you an email. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Cheryl. Uh, I work for a sheriff's department uh, in the Midwest. I, I edited that part out. Right. Uh, I just got back from your understanding exclusions class. I actually didn't teach that class, but sometimes John just teaches it without me. Sometimes right. I'm there, you know, depending on how it gets booked. Anyway, I just got back from the understanding exclusions class. Uh, I have been binge listening to Double Loop. And, well, first of all, I, and in capitals, love the dad jokes. Cheryl <laughs> loves your dad jokes. Hey, thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Yep, so you have at least three fans, again, of the dad jokes. Well, that was another one, because we got an email, I think we mentioned it, from Sandy Siegel uh, down in Texas, who, who also, um, well, she was she was a little bit more uh, specific. She liked some and didn't like others, so. <laughs> I, I think... Um, I think all the of our listeners down in Australia that that uh, are are the big haters of the dad joke, um, I think they need to put their brains together and come up with with uh, the gimmick for next year's um, uh, shows. Ooh, uh, I like that. Maybe 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 if you can you know throw me some ideas on on a stupid way to introduce the show. Uh, we've been through alliteration and oh I've puns. got one. Oh what's I've that? got one. Crazy uh, facts. Fact. Oh, crazy ones. facts. Ooh, crazy I facts. like it. Well, I'm, like I'm a big number... fan of the of the BBC show QI, which is all about crazy yeah. facts. So, um, that's a great idea, Glenn. All I right. was just listening to uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he, yeah. you know, he loves giving out crazy facts. And he had given one where he was drinking a glass of water. He was talking about that there are more molecules in this glass of water than, you know, all the glasses that have ever been drank before or, you know, all the planets or, you know, all the galaxies and planets and blah, 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 in the solar system and just going on and on. And he was talking about how there are molecules in this glass of water that he's drinking, given how molecules can disperse. Right. There are molecules in this glass of water that have passed through the body of Genghis Khan, Martin Luther King, <laughs> and, and he just named off a bunch of people. And just if you go back through wow. time, I, I mean, it, it and it, it's super deep, but also completely makes sense because there are so many trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of molecules that, yeah, at, at least some portion of those molecules have been through famous people. You know, one that I actually mentioned um, in that um that class that i did with the lawyers the forensic science academy uh try to give them an idea of of um of you know how big some of these numbers can get uh one of the other little factoids was that when you shuffle a deck of cards you know like sufficiently like i think it's like six or seven good riffle shuffles will will you know is a sufficient is a, is a you know sufficiently randomizes the deck once yep. you get it like that it is the first time that any deck of cards in history has ever been in that order. <laughs> and um, to get an idea of how many different ways you you can order a deck of cards, um, the, this is on the QI show, uh, it would take every... If you took every star in our galaxy, and every star had a trillion planets, and each planet had a trillion people, 
and each of those people had a trillion packs of cards, and somehow <laughs> they managed to shuffle each of those trillion packs of cards a thousand times a second, and somehow do it so that every time they shuffled it, it would be a different you know arrangement, um, and they'd never duplicate it among all those trillions of people on the trillions of planets and every star in our galaxy. And they started doing it at the Big Bang. They would only just now start to repeat uh, orders of the, of of, uh, uh, wow. of a deck of cards, which is fifty two cards. Wow, that is that is pretty incredible. All right, well there we go. There we go. Unless someone has a better idea, that's that's what we're going with for next year. So, um, speaking of Sandy, though, um, you know, in her in one of her emails to us, um, you know, she she uh, she wants to be a guest on the show, so we'll definitely be. I'm uh, looking to find time, maybe even next month, to uh, to interview her. Um, and uh, she also mentioned that she's always looking for submissions to uh, FIG, the Fingerprint Interest Group, and to QUIP, which is the quite unusual something In- something. Interesting. Pattern. And interesting patterns, that's right. Um, so FIG, she you know publishes, uh, sends out in her in her emails, it's just interesting comparisons with some sort of distortion or, um, you know, something that's really close uh, or just something that just is an interesting comparison. While the quip is an exemplar uh, that has an interesting pattern in it, like a like a triple loop or um, one of those ones that just kind of goes up to the top of the finger instead of down to the to the bottom and. All sorts of, of weird things uh, in Quip. So, um, if you have anything like that and uh, want to share with you know, the fingerprint world, um, or if you just want to join Sandy Siegel's email list, you can contact her at s Siegel. So that's s s i e g e l at HoustonForensicScience.org. Uh, so, it, it's always nice to get. Uh, to get those, a lot of the times she sends out just notifications for you know, when different classes are coming out. Um, but uh, the, you know, there's other interesting questions also mixed in, and with all her emails as well. All right, so for this week, uh, the main topic is going to be a new paper uh, that was published recently in the Journal of Forensic Sciences by uh, Amy, uh, boy, Jingenot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not even sure about that myself. It's French, but it's, I would have said uh, Jean Gunat. Jean Gunat. Okay, I think I was close. I just put. I, I knew I shouldn't have put the T on the end. <laughs> um. Anyway, uh, it's J E A N G U E N A T and Etiel Drawer, uh, and it's called Human Factors Affecting Forensic Decision Making, Workplace Stress and Well Being. Uh, so a quick summary is, um, it's just, I, I just, I'm sorry. I, I can't get past it. I just realized there's an error in the title. It should be an A, not an E. It's a verb. Oh. Human factors affecting <laughs> forensic decision-making. <laughs> All right. Sorry, ETL, but <laughs> I, I, I didn't notice that till just now. Well, you know, hopefully that, that's something that the journal should have caught. I, I, I'm pretty sure. Damn straight. That neither author is English as a first language. I'm guessing. Um, I, I know Etiel has a heavy accent, uh, even though he's kind of lived everywhere. But um, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Shame on you, JFS. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, um, sorry. I, I would never li- live with myself if I didn't say those right, words. Right. Right. No. It's uh, it's 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 one of those. Uh, it's it's why you know people. Some people make you know good forensic scientists is because they pay attention to the details like that, and it bugs them when it's just slightly wrong. Um, and we all know that being technically correct is the best kind of correct. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, this uh, this paper uh, came to me through ETL, and um, I really had I, I have to say I really like this paper. Uh, overall, the the concept is. Um, there are more factors, um, more human factors at play than just bias. So it was, it was a refreshing message from ETL, who gets obviously so heavily associated with bias and bias issues. But um, there are more factors, or human factors besides just bias, and that um, we can become um, affected, a, a, 
affected by uh, stress and um, you know lack of sleep and uh, criticism and pressure of work and just all these kinds of stress factors that we get at work beyond just this issue of bias and that we work in a really difficult field and that there are lots of issues that are very unique to our field that cause additional stress and that all of these little factors over time can um, just affect our, our, our overall performance and um, our job satisfaction and um, you know, how, how we generally enjoy doing what we do. So, I mean, that, that's the, the, the main part of it. Uh, the, the paper identifies several factors that are very specific to forensic work and then some solutions for, for dealing with that. So, should we go down the list of the, the things that affect us? Yeah, it, it, you know, they, they break it into kind of things that affect, you know, lots of people, but then, you know, the specific ones to, to the forensic discipline. And, um, I agree. I, I, you know, while not, um, it's funny, like as opposed to last week, which was very, um, very data driven, uh, you know, this is, this is more of a concept paper uh, without mm -hmm. really, you know, data, uh, you know, behind it, but, uh, it does bring up very, um, very important topics um, that uh, you know I can you know really recognize even in my own workplace uh, as um, yeah, as issues that, that yeah I, that people I, struggle with and that the the agency doesn't really know how to deal with. Yeah, I I would I did the same thing. I was projecting and self identifying. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, that's a little me. Yeah, oh yeah, that's definitely <laughs> me. That's I it it really did put its finger on a lot of the stress I think I had been feeling the last couple of years at at my work as well. But um, one of the the facts that stood out, uh, which was a nice to see it in print here, was that uh, given the educational level of many forensic scientists, uh, the wage that they make is actually on, on the lower end. The, the mean annual wage for a forensic scientist in the U.S. is approximately $60,000, which, you know, I mean, again, this is going to insult some people and, you know, and others um, might not mean that much, but you know, given, um, again, you know, four year or even six years or higher degrees that, you know, forensic scientists are routinely having to, you know, or to get to be competitive. So right. you go to school for four years and then you get the master's, you know, in industry. I and mean, when I was working for 3M and other companies, I mean, starting salaries were 90000 a 100000 I mean, you know, for someone with a master's to PhD, it wasn't uncommon, you know, to start there. It's just the benefits of government work are, of course, you know, the, the health care and longevity of the position that you're not going to be losing your job anytime soon, whereas you didn't have that job security in industry. Right. But, you uh, you know, you end up taking a, a lower wage than you could make comparably in the private sector. So, you know, and, and it, it talked about that, but that wasn't the main thing that it, it focused on, which was kind of nice that these things are not usually just about money. Right, right. That, that's that's definitely a thing. Uh, you know, right now our agency's uh, going through some struggles with that right now, trying to convince the powers that be that, you know, that this is an issue. Um, that, <clears throat> one of the, the workup I did, that... Um, compared to wages in 2000 adjusted for inflation, you know, the, the sworn positions are basically the same as that they were in 2000. Um, and while like my position, uh, is making $20,000 less than we were, uh, back then. Um, yeah. that's, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's that, just not that's a, a little thing. You know, 20 grand is, uh, you know, a year. That's, that's a significant Thing. Oh, yeah. And it's a significant issue that that um, you know is definitely a a uh, an argument in favor of separating the crime lab from the police force uh, and making it its its own separate agency, uh, whether that be you know more public private kind of like what they did in Houston or just a different department under the, in the government somewhere. Um, you know that that um, that that uh, that definitely is an argument for that. 
Yeah. And and I admit that, I mean, my situation, I'm actually quite happy with my salary. I think it is fair for, for you know, the work that I'm doing. Um, but I, I can appreciate that. And at, no, I'm a supervisor, but at the bench level, especially starting off, um, s- starting forensic scientists, I think, are somewhat surprised by how low the wages are. Yeah. Um, and we're... <laughs> I think we're a little on the opposite end. We actually, for our starting people, pay decent, but by the time you top out, it's really low. Uh, mm. Which can, and my my agency is the opposite. Which you know leads to lots of problems of people you know just leaving. <laughs> um, but uh, hopefully things get worked out, and uh, uh, and like we talked about last week that data can be used to affect decision making but we'll have to wait and see what happens yeah so one of the other things they point out which i I thought was very interesting and i was glad the paper went there without any uh, apologies was that you know they say that the forensic field has become predominantly more female and you know they note that uh, 78 percent of uh, the forensic science is made up of females, and so certain factors and stresses that might affect females more than men are, have to be an important cultural factor in considering uh, women's health and workplace performance. And I thought that was interesting too. That this isn't a one size fits all. Recognizing that there are these differences between men and women, you know, in a society that seems ever. Um, ever trying to make us seem like the differences aren't that great. It was nice that this paper, you know, is willing to to look at some of those and and parse that out a little bit. So I thought yep. that was that was that was uh, noteworthy. Uh, you know, I, and I, I've I've noted this for a while now. Uh, um, even when I first started in the field, I noticed that most of of uh, the lab was predominantly female. Even though at the time when I started, my unit in Leighton Prince was mostly male. Uh, that did quickly change, and it's now mostly female. Um, and yeah, then even here. when um, I went to teach at the FBI in Quantico, they, you know, they had basically the whole unit, except for people who were like off on vacation, or, you know, with, it was like 50 people, so it was impossible to schedule it for everybody. But of like the 50 people in there, less than 10 of them were, were guys. It was... Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> It was, uh, you know, 80% plus 80 to 85% uh, female just actively working. So, you know, the numbers there that they cite from just people in um, in college courses really does seem to, to be carrying over to what we're actually seeing, uh, you know, people with, you know, in the jobs. Yeah. Yep. So then the paper goes on to talk about the unique industry-specific pressures that are placed on forensic scientists and managers. And I, and I really did find these to be actually very accurate and pretty insightful. Yeah. So I'm, just, I'm going to go down the list, and I'll define them, and we can talk about them. Uh, the first is technique criticism, that uh, the essentially there are these groups that are coming out like NAS and PCAST that are critically examining the entire field. They look at what we do, and they all have armchair quarterback status and all have a view on what we do, and of course it tends to be highly critical. So uh, they call it technique criticism, but it really is, I, I think of it as external criticism, if you will. Um, the second one is just exposure to case details is that, you know, we work these very violent and sometimes disturbing cases. Um, I don't know if you've ever had to process evidence from, you know, kitty porn cases or other cases where you become intimately detailed with uh, or knowledgeable of details that you wish you had not become intimately familiar with. Yeah. And and, you know, and they they can have an effect. And I worked crime scenes for a number of years, and you know those things stick with you. So, those uh, sort of exposure to violent and horrible, terrible things, and that you know, just any of those sorts of details can have a long-lasting effect and cause stress. Uh, the third thing was uh, funding, that many forensic laboratories are under substantial funding pressure, uh, whether through grant funding or uh, they have temporary positions that if they don't get funded by legislation, they have to cut positions, that there is this stress of where is our funding coming from. We tend to have our, you know, secure jobs, 
But those things, you know, those annual raises and those other things we come to hope for, obviously, are always uh, a fight every legislative session. <laughs> uh, you guys get annual raises. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, depending on the legislative session. <laughs> Uh, the next system was, or the ne- next one was the adversarial legal system, and, I, and this one is so so specific to forensic scientists that I don't think people outside our discipline, which is what annoys me, is when you hear some of the critics and some of the academics and those were so very nonchalant about their recommendations in this, wouldn't really understand the situations that we're in because of that adversarial legal system, the pressure that is constantly on us, and even the attorneys that love to criticize and, you know, some of the things they say, if if they ever had to testify and follow the rules that they impose on us, Uh I don't know know how they would hold up to the challenge, some of them. But point being, um, it is very stressful, obviously, having to – well, the paper says we're often pawns in legal litigation, and that's exactly how it feels. And you talked about that as much in the last episode about you came in with a conclusion that means something to you, and now you've got at least two other people trying to spin that conclusion to fit their narrative. You're a pawn in their games. (laughs) And and that's – that kind of stress, you know, I think kind of led to what I said – you know, as the follow up to that of yep. of now being in the position where I just don't care. Uh, <laughs> yep. And uh, the last one is, and this of course is the one that you know I just I just love is that all these things, this you know, um, lower wages. Um, well, actually, it doesn't talk about the overwhelming backlogs that we face. Uh, that might come a little bit later, but. Um, you know, we've got these overwhelming backlogs. We've, you know, the lower pay, exposure to just awful, terrible things, constant criticism from outside the field, uh, constant issues with, you know, legal battles in court and all this. And then lastly, in all of that, a zero tolerance for error culture that, and now you have to be perfect. All these things on top of this. Oh, and don't make any mistakes. Well, you know, that's the easy part is just never making any <laughs> mistake. Right. Yeah, no, it, it it's they do talk about just earlier in the page that um you know, especially uh I, I think what the line here I think is is specifically mentioning uh, refer, referring to DNA cases when it says that uh, with you know technology advancements forensic science is being used in new ways especially on lesser crimes. Um so I think in fingerprints, at least, we've we've always just done everything. I, I don't think we're we're being asked to do any kind of new cases that we were never asked to do in the past. But DNA definitely is uh, looking at just like you know touch DNA on a burglary, which they were you know they were never asked to in the past. Even when it went back to the serology days, uh, definitely not asked unless there was actually blood left somewhere. Um, and that kind of ties back into the tolerance for errors. You, you, even on, um, the, you know, attempted theft of a bicycle, bicycle seat, uh, there's a zero tolerance for error. Um, and, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is a, it's an understandable culture, um, that, that's set up, but, you know, depending on, um, depending on the agency you work for and the quality assurance people that you have, you know, they may not understand um, kind of where to draw the line between um, on how to deal with different types of, of mistakes, honest errors, um, random errors, or, you know, more serious kinds. Um, you know, maybe, maybe this does actually tie into latent prints a little bit more. And I thought that I w- when I was in Pittsburgh um, a couple weeks ago, uh, we were kind of sharing war stories and had some of the similarities in that, you know, we may be, you know, at a certain point, but DNA people are, have a, have a bigger backlog than we do. So if we want to go through and actually work a specific case, um, then we're basically some, a lot of times told, okay, you guys just take one and take the swabs and then do your fingerprint stuff. Um, uh, or even, both of us were, were saying 
you know, DNA has basically decided they're not going to actually do anything in this case because the officer didn't submit the proper um, uh, victim uh, swabs, you know, all the rules that you have for CODIS. Um, but if the submitter ever just decided to send all that stuff in, then they will need it done. So if you want to do your fingerprint stuff on it, then you also have to take the swabs. And um, they called themselves the, the Nike section, the just mm-hmm. do it section. Um, mm-hmm. Well, well, we, we Leighton Prince doesn't have the luxury often of saying, no, we're not going to do this or that. We just have to do it. While other sections like DNA may say, okay, we're going to defer on this one. We're only going to take three items of evidence from this case. Um, we're not going to do any work on this case um, because of X, you know, Y, and Z reasons. Yeah, that's a good example. That's a that's a really good example of that. Oh, you know, I was I was going to say too. Um, I shared this article with uh, my coworker Carrie Hall. And she had added one to this that I thought, I mean, it falls under those categories a bit, but I, again, something I think we can appreciate, that there's an added stress that comes, you know, the criticism, you know, from external, but we also have internal criticism. And one of the things that she mentioned was the constant stress and pressure during technical reviews, uh, that when you give these yeah. to your colleagues, you know, they go, well, I agree with this, but oh, I don't like this, or I would have done this differently, or I probably would say it this way or that. And then you get this constant little needling, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts that they might not be this harsh criticism overall, but it's the constant, oh, you need to fix this or fix that or fix that. Well, and then you get in these little mini battles. Maybe this goes towards some of the gender differences that were raised earlier <laughs> um some take it a little more personally and then you yep. get into these well oh, she's this and she's that and well, why is she always oh, and then this you know, and then this back and forth and this um it, it becomes a bigger thing it, it takes on a life of its own i think in some ways that please fix this becomes uh, some sort of indictment of that person or it just I it can see that as um, uh, a stress it, it definitely adds to more stress absolutely we we um, it, we I don't know how we decided well I, I was kind of pushing because I was actually kind of getting tired of all that mm-hmm. so I made a push a few years ago um, to basically force everybody from all four of our labs into the same room and we were going to figure out how the reports were going to read for everybody in every situation that we could think of. And we were all going to have the exact same words in the exact same order, um, no matter you know who was writing the report um, for the majority of the cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it took all day, uh, but we eventually hammered out a, um, a uh, you know, committee approved or or you know uh, uh you know reasonable take everybody's ideas and mix them up and then come out with something in between that everybody could live with and um that really helped tremendously um and then i think we also took that concept and went further uh, i think first of all having the the clear rules for how to separate exclusion for inconclusive kind of a call back to last week really helped with that uh but then uh finally in with the whole tech review process um it, you know beyond just the words the, uh, and the the techniques and stuff um that get used uh, the words in the report and the, the processing techniques uh the whole what do you compare or not um mm-hmm. we basically came to this this understanding that Whatever the tech reviewer said, if you, the tech reviewer said you had to compare it, then you have to compare it. And um, so the, the tech reviewer kind of feels freer to, to, to select some out and say, hey, this one too, this one too. And uh, without you know, worrying that, oh, you know, this person's going to just go ballistic because I always find stuff with that person. Um, so uh, anyway, we... we a few years ago kind of saw that thing that Carrie was talking about and at least have tried to kind of 
work with that in in the small ways that we could uh, because I, I I agree with her that is a that's a terrible thing to to on either either end of it to be the reviewer and having to go if I hand this back right. they're just gonna go through the roof and I don't want to have to deal with this crap today uh, or you know having that that feeling of this person's always finding you know problems with my stuff um, and kind of finding a way through that and around that I, I think really helped us out at the time yeah, uh, it, 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 I think it was a, an astute point on her part about just that kind of additional stressor that wasn't in the article. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, so uh, and, and any others that uh, you think should be added, Eric, that were not mentioned in there? I mean, the, the, you know, the crushing casework for me is, is the one I really feel in, in my section as a supervisor. We just have just such an unbelievable backlog and rush cases i think that's right. another one the article doesn't really talk about as much as those shifting priorities that you think it's going to be the well i'm going to be working these cases and now you get that phone call that says well we need you down at the me's office to take some prints or you need uh you, you know the court's coming up next week and the officer didn't bring the evidence in until today so you need to process it right now that constant volume of Stop yeah. what you're doing and, and do this. Stop and what you're do doing this. and do that. Yeah, I, I I think that that pressure is especially felt on agencies, kind of a step down from from us, the county and city. Uh, being up at the state level, I, I don't feel that pressure as much. Um, mm. I, I'm I'm much more of a uh, well, maybe it's just I've reached this level of. Well, if they really wanted all this done, they, they'd give us more money and more people. Um, so they must not really want it done. Um, and I, I think the stress is different for on the supervisor side where you're at. Um, but uh, I think overall we're, we're pretty well shielded from that, um, being that most of our work is done for other agencies. But I know especially if you're, if you're there and you see basically your customers every day, uh, that that does add into that stress a lot more. All right. Well, <laughs> why don't we talk about their solutions then? So yes. here are some some of the things that they talk about. So um, they they make the 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 notion, of course, that you know humans, when stressed, uh, have an evolutionary reaction of fight or flight to stress uh, that used to obviously have some special function back in the day uh thousands of years ago but even though we have these minor little stresses you know such as the you know getting your case done or caseload or whatever you're not you're not being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger um you still have the same kind of fight or flight stress response and that you know these stress the stress still produces that so what they're looking at are ways to essentially not remove the stress, which was interesting, change the response. I mean, that's ultimately what the paper talks about is it, it suggests that, well, that's the environment you're in. That's the stress you're going to get. So if you can't remove those stressors, then change how your body responds to the stress. So the, some of the things they mentioned, exercise, eating more healthier, meditation, vacations and, and outside hobbies. I guess it I guess it doesn't help, Glenn, that, that you and I both use our vacation time in part to go do other fingerprint stuff and teach. And my hobby is podcasting with you, so <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. So um And and it, magic. And ma well that's the thing, is magic. Um and uh so you know, maybe we could, we can definitely work on that. But they do spend a lot of time talking about uh, mindfulness training. Right. Uh, yeah, so they talk about uh, big organizations such as Google, Target, Accenture, Salesforce, General Mills, Aetna, uh, etc. have all recognized the advantages of mindfulness training and send their employees to these courses. Uh, did you have a chance to uh, look up what mindfulness training is? I'd never heard of it until this, this article. I, 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 I kind of got the gist for, from reading the article, but I didn't look up any further um... Uh, any further information on it? What'd you learn? All right. 
Well, I looked up one of their references, which was this report from 2010. I think it was reference number 41 in the article. Uh, yeah, Hallowell uh, Mindfulness Report commissioned by the Mental Health Foundation in 2010. It's on the internet. Looks like it's a UK report. And um, it actually has some definitions of mindfulness. And what I was really looking for was evidence because the the paper itself – didn't give any evidence of be, or any data, you know, for example, uh, you know, I'm throwing a number out right. here. I'm just making this up. You know, 80% of latent print examiners that engaged in mindfulness training found that they blah, 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 blah. You know, if it, there w- wasn't anything behind it or even if not latent print examiners, just data about the effectiveness of mindfulness training. It just said mindfulness has been shown to be effective. So um, – I, I was curious and wanted to look look it up. So I got a definition here. So from that report, this Hallowell report from 2010, it defined mindfulness as a way of paying attention to the present moment by using meditation, yoga, and breathing techniques. It involves consciously bringing awareness to our thoughts and feelings without making judgments about them. It is a method for observing what is happening right now in our bodies, minds, and the world around us. So... That's that's what it is. And I was a little surprised um, because, boy, I think I traveled back in time again, and I think it's 1974. And I think <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, <laughs> this sounds very hippy-dippy to me, but I should – I'm not – look, I'm not dismissing it because there's data in this. There's plenty of right. data. Um, I just was surprised that mindfulness was yoga and breathing and meditation. But you know those Eastern monks, uh, there, there's something, something to their their health and 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 happiness. Right. Um, so, and that's that's again from just the article talking about you know breath functions and conscious communication, focused attention, um, uh, physical movement. So I'm like, oh, that sounds like yoga and meditation. Um, uh, so. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting to see what what that could do with a you know workplace program that implemented something like this. Um, I, I'm not sure how many police agencies have something like this, even for officers. Uh, I, I Good point. you know I wouldn't be surprised if there are some, but um, I wouldn't. I don't expect it to be you know really um, you know common at least throughout the U.S. Uh, but uh, you know definitely something that that might have a uh, a positive uh, result for for that agency, and <clears throat> you know definitely could um, could then also impact the um, uh, the forensic science labs as well. I, I, I still think, uh, at least initially, you know, for at least for our agency, you know, spend the money on on the people first, and then <laughs> then spend some of the money on on. Uh, you know, on, on a program like this, but, um, you know, every agency's, you know, has its, is it's in its, in its own place and, you know, can kind of look at ways to, uh, improve the mental health of, um, of the people that work there. Yeah. And, you know, the, the report that I'm referencing here, uh, does give some statistics and data and references lots of studies, um, you know, they talk about, you know, it has the effects of mental well-being, people who uh, were mindful, less likely to experience psychological distress, including depression and anxiety. Uh, it also is linked with uh, a sense of uh, physical well-being and physical health. It talked about also um, a better ability to express oneself in social situations, greater empathy, you know, I guess, um, you know, understanding your place in the universe, that sort of thing. So um, being less selfish about your needs and better at communicating, less troubled by relationship conflict. But then here's the stuff I thought was pretty cool was the neuroscience behind it. And uh, I'd like to look, I'd like to spend a little more time looking at these studies, but at least the report pulls out that, um, I'll just read this here. Mindfulness meditation for 40 minutes a day had greater cortical thickening in areas of the right prefrontal cortex and right anterior insula of the brain. Uh, these areas have been associated with decision-making, attention, and awareness. 
Uh, there is also a proportionate relationship between the increase in cortical thickness and the relative meditation experience of the subjects. People undertaking mindfulness training have also shown an increase in activation of the left prefrontal cortex, an area of the brain associated with positive emotions and generally less active in people who are depressed. So it, it showed some brain function changes and the um, there's a few other studies that talk about changes in the uh, prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, and a few other areas of the brain, and how um, meditation, if these data are accurate and these studies are you know hold up, uh, that it might actually change brain physiology, you know, brain functioning, and so on. I thought that was actually pretty interesting, um, and again, speaks to the health and, and happiness of those. <laughs> Eastern monks that uh, have been um, promoting this philosophy for thousands of years. Exactly. Yep. So, and yeah, it's something too that uh, I remember Japanese companies, you know, uh, doing in you know in the eighties and nineties, and probably still today, where they you know all meet in the courtyard. They do you know either tai chi or movements right. or you know as a group, not just individually, but right. you know, as a group. Uh, it, the kind of thing to clear their mind and uh, their body and so on. And, and then, you know, I, I don't usually think of things in that way. Of course, I'm rare American. I'm looking for the quick fix and uh, <laughs> well, what pill do I take or remove the stressor, not change my behavior or change my actions. You know, right. the, the typical American thinking, well, just do this thing so I don't have to, I don't have to work so hard at it. Um, but, you know, this is suggesting that this could be very helpful for us. And so maybe I should be giving it a try. Well, as a supervisor, Glenn, you may be able to implement uh, this this concept. Is I've heard that uh, in Japanese businesses, if... Um, I, I love it. If a supervisor goes past yes. uh, a cubicle and the, and the worker is, is sleeping, then the supervisor thinks, oh, wow, that guy is working hard. If he... If he fell asleep at work, I mean, he is on it. <laughs> I, I'd i also love to tell the officer or the uh, attorney, sorry, we didn't get to your case today. We're meditating. Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking about what it would look like to analyze it. We just haven't right. got around to doing it today. <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm envisioning what that would look like. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, all you need is is um, you know the right person up the chain of command that can uh, you know take take the brunt of those hits, and uh, then you know it's all kind of deflected from uh, the people underneath. Um, so, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't know that the paper had anything else other than the mindfulness. If I mean, I, it, it was very insightful, and, and like I said, hit a right. number of of raw nerves for me. Um, and that these things, these kinds of you know, people who have to operate with this stress and pressure every day, ultimately will have you know, the, you know potentially issues or poor performance or you know poor mental health. So. I think uh, I, I think it, it is raising some good issues. I was looking for a, a couple more solutions or some other things too. Um, you know, they talk right. about um, you know how uh, how to institute this as a culture mindfulness and you know changing how we communicate and a few other things. But it still kept coming back to mindfulness. There weren't any other suggestions beyond mindfulness. But uh, I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, he can partner with with some agency, and and there and there could be some data collected on on uh, how helpful uh, this kind of process is. Maybe, yeah. maybe he can even expand. And you know, you're looking for other other ideas, right? Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, besides mindfulness, maybe he can, as one of the concepts to to look for ways to de stress, is listening to the double loop podcast oh, i love it nice tie-in well done sir as as a way to uh to recenter uh to be mindful about you know fingerprints in general and latent print topics uh <clears throat> and our soothing voices our soothing voices can uh either on the way to work way home from work or just during work can reset people and put them in a a better state uh, where they're they're calm and ready to take on 
the additional stresses that may come their way. Good idea, Eric. Well done. <laughs> Congratulations, everyone out there that's listening right now. Uh, I hope you feel more mindful uh, and uh, more relaxed for having spent uh, this time with us. That, that'll be our, the new the new opening for our show. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, Glenn, anything else you want to uh, to mention before we wrap up this week? No. Uh, if people want a copy of the paper, uh, sure, you can reach out to ETL. Uh, he's always uh, good about getting people copies, or certainly email us or me at, at Glenn J L E N N at EliteForensicServices dot com. Uh, and also myself, Eric at RayForensics dot com. Uh, So thanks for listening this week. Listen to us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or on iTunes, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Have a good week. Have a less stressful week.